Okay, so um, this talk is really just to, to, to go through how you can do an ultrasound and find endometriosis. So it's just going to go from organ to organ, looking at different things. And I show you a normal clip and an abnormal clip so that you can um, sort of get an understanding of what we can see with ultrasound. Because look at the symptoms of endometriosis. I mean, pain with periods, so dysmenorrhea, pain with sex, dyspareunia, pain with bowel movements, um, pain with urination, but bleeding from the bowel, abnormal bleeding, heavy bleeding, infertility, chronic pelvic pain, those for sure are refer, um, referring indications that you see on the pelvic ultrasound referrals all of the time. Um, these women um, are referred for pelvic ultrasounds so often um, that we really need to make an effort to at least see the main pathology that can be re responsible for those um, symptoms. I, I strongly believe that looking for endometriosis should not be a specialty assessment. It should be part of a routine scan. Um, in Melbourne, they refer patients to me for an endometriosis assessment, and I think, well, why don't I get referrals for a polyp assessment or a fibroid assessment? Or, I mean, like, it's just a female pathology that we can see with, with, with ultrasound, and we should just include that in a normal scan, particularly because it is common and it causes symptoms that impact on um, every aspect of the patient's life. For me, everything changed in 2009. In 2009, this article was um, published by a group in Brazil by Manuel Abrao and, um, and, um, and Manuel Gonzalves and Maurizio Abrao. Um, they came and presented um, their results of um, diagnosing deep infiltrating endometriosis on the World Conference in Melbourne in 2008, the World Endometriosis Conference. And my husband was one of the organizers and he said, that I should just attend and come and have a look at this talk, and I didn't, of course. But when he went to that talk, he said, well, why don't we have something like this in Melbourne? I mean, like, this would be so useful to know in advance um, that there is deep infiltrating endometriosis. You have to go and learn this and do, do this at your practice. So I read this article, and it describes the technique of how to do it, but I still couldn't work out what I had to do. So I decided to go to Brazil and learn from Maurizio and, um, and Manuel. And really, the only thing they said that I should do is put a probe in the posterior fornix and look at a patch of Douglas. It was eye-opening. I had been doing ultrasound for a long time, and um, I thought I was pretty good at it. Um, and, and yet, I was missing all this pathology um, that they could see um, just by putting the probe at the end of the scan in the posterior fornix and looking carefully at where endometriosis actually occurs. So before 2009, I looked at the uterus and the endometrium and the ovaries. And um, after 2009, I started looking at the uterus and the mobility of the uterus, um, the endometrium, the ovaries, and the mobility in the ovaries of the ovaries. Uh, but I also looked at the bladder and then mainly the patch of Douglas. And when you put the probe in the posterior fornix, you can look at the vagina, you can look at the bowel, you can look at the uterosacral ligaments, and you can see whether there's patch of Douglas obliteration. And I guess the two most important things for surgeons um, to have some warning about the degree of difficulty is, is there, is, is there patch of Douglas obliteration or are there bowel nodules? Because those are the hardest things to deal with if you don't know that they're there. <coughs> so the uterus I'm not going to spend much time on. Everybody knows how to look at the uterus. But just one thing, if you see this, that is such a red flag for severe deep infiltrating endometriosis. The uterus, you can see that the uterus it wants to sit in an antiverted position. The cervix is sort of in an antiverted position, but the uterus is then um, retroflex. It's completely pulled to the back. And not only that, the anterior myometrium looks normal, and the posterior myometrium is thick and heterogeneous. Um, so there's adenomyosis in the posterior wall. So almost certainly there will, will be deep infiltrating endometriosis in that pelvis. Um, same with the ovaries. I mean, you can look at mobility, and sometimes it's really clear. Um, here you can sort of see that here the ovary is sliding, but it's not sliding away from the uterus. It's clearly stuck, whilst this ovary is clearly mobile. 
It's not always that clear. I mean, it can be very difficult to assess mobility, and it's not always correlating very well with laparoscopy, because sometimes it's really painful, you don't dare to push, you have the wrong angle. Um, so if that's the only finding, that the ovary is not moving well, then I wouldn't be too, um, too worried about it. But obviously, when you see an endometrioma, um, then, um, then um, I would be worried about deep infiltrating endometriosis, because... Um, um, although endometriomas can be other things, I mean, we don't always get it right. Um, um, you can have a cyst adenoma that looks similar. You can have a dermoid that looks similar. You can have a hemorrhagic cyst. But if it is a true endometrioma, then almost invariably will there be severe um, endometriosis in the, in, the, in the pelvis as well. So just diagnosing the endometrioma is not enough. You need to really look to see what deep infiltrating endometriosis is present and whether it's on the bowel or not and whether the patch is obliterated or not. So um, when we look for associated deep infiltrating endometriosis, we look for bladder nodules. Um, we look for vaginal nodules in the posterior compartment. We look for bowel nodules, for patch of Douglas obliteration. And then um, once you get really good at it, um, sacro-uterine ligament nodules, because they are incredibly difficult, and I couldn't see them for two years. Um, but now I see them everywhere. Um, so. Um, so that looks like a lot to look at, but it doesn't take very long. So when we look at the bladder, bladder endometriosis is quite uncommon. Um, I've only seen four, but I missed one of them because I didn't look at the bladder. If it's not common, you don't look very, um, very carefully, but um, it's very quick. So therefore, this is a normal bladder. So the uterus is here. This is the bladder wall here. And the bladder wall is clearly nice and thin and it's outlined by a little bit of urine, and it will slide here over the uterus. So when we push, there's nice sliding of the bladder, and it's a thin wall. And then I'm going to contrast it each time with an abnormal um, clip. So this is the abnormal clip. So this is the nodule in the bladder wall. You always see a little track that goes, that tracks back to the uterus, because it starts sort of on the uterus in the physical uterine patch, and then it grows into the bladder wall. It can grow completely through the bladder, and then people will menstruate when they, when they urinate um, during their period. Um, but, um, but it's very easy to see because hyper, um, um, endometriosis are big hyperechoic nodules and they stand out. Um, but as I said, bladder endometriosis is not that common. Um, so, um, so it will be a while before you see one. Um, the posterior compartment is much more common, so uh, the patch of Douglas. Um, so when we put the probe in the posterior fornix, um, we can see the patch of Douglas properly, and that's what we need to do. Um, so when you put the probe in the posterior fornix, first you'll see the vaginal wall here, um, right in front of your um, probe, so you can look for a nodule in the vaginal wall. Um, you can look at the bowel, and then you can also push on the uterus to see whether the uterus is going to slide over the bowel because with patch of Douglas obliteration it basically means that something is stuck to the back of the uterus so that the surgeon cannot look into the patch of Douglas anymore with laparoscopy. So you will always find something stuck on the back of the uterus if there's patch of Douglas obliteration and so therefore you need that dynamic assessment by pushing on the uterus. And then you can also look at the uterosacral ligament but that's for the next talk because that's really subtle. So vagina, again, I'm going to show you a normal one. I'm going to show you an abnormal one. So this is um, normal cervix, putting the probe in the posterior phonics. There's a little bit of fluid, and that makes it easier to see the vaginal wall. And the vaginal wall, I'll play that again. It doesn't want to play anymore. Right, we'll go back. So the vaginal wall has a very thin hyperechoic layer, and then it has a hyperechoic layer over the top. So that's a, that little fat layer that goes over the top. And, um, and so if there is a, um, if there is a vaginal nodule, um, again, it's going to be a big hyperechoic clump. Now, that was easy because um, there was fluid um, in the patch, but even if there's no fluid, you can see the vaginal wall here. It's that hyperechoic layer with a hyperechoic layer over the top of it. And, and when you push, you can see that everything is sliding over the vagina um, and that the vaginal wall is really thin. And even when the uterus is retroverted, um, you can see the vaginal wall really well um, with the hyperechoic layer over the top of it. Um, so that's a normal, this is in transverse section, a normal 
thin vaginal wall with no problems. When we look for a vaginal nodule, it's going to look like a hypochoic clump on the vaginal wall. So here you put the probe in and see how there's this big clump um, sitting in the posterior. You, you don't see it at all from the anterior fornix. So if you put the probe in and just look at the <coughs> uterus and, and the ovaries, you will not have seen it. But when you put it in the posterior fornix, it's right there in front of you and it can be quite big. Usually it's tender, but surprisingly, not always. Some women don't have pain on a big clump like that. When you go completely to the side here, you still see the normal vaginal wall. So that's a normal hyperechoic layer um, with the um, hyperechoic layer over the top. And then when you go more to the middle, you come across this big clump. That's clearly a thickening on the vaginal wall. And then further to the right, the vaginal wall is thin again. Um, same for the bell. We're looking for hypochoic clumps on the bell. So the bell runs in between the uterosacral ligament, so it sort of goes up behind the vagina, and then usually it goes to um, the left. And normally we can see about 30 centimeters of the bell, and that's usually where most of the endometriosis will occur, is on that first 30 centimeters, um, sort of proximal from the anus. So the bell has three layers that we can distinctly recognize on ultrasound. There is a muscle layer, there's a submucosa layer, and there is a mucosa layer. And so the, um, the, the muscle layer is even sort of, you can on ultrasound often recognize sort of the external and the internal um, layer. It's sort of, the, um, sort of a fine white, white line between the two. But in general, endometriosis is gonna grow from the outside in. So it's gonna be a clump that will start growing on the muscle layer and it will push the submucosa forward. So here you see um, this is thickened and it pushes the submucosa forward. Eventually it will grow through the submucosa and then through the mucosa and give bleeding from the bowel. So when you want to look at the bowel systematically, you need to pull the probe just out of the vagina, almost out of the vagina to the introitus, angle it a little bit to the bowel and then push it in and then just follow the muscle layer and just keep your eye on it, just like a tubular structure. It doesn't go um, in the same direction in everyone, so you just follow it. And the, the, the following clip shows that. So you pull it all the way to the entrance of the vagina and then you keep your eye just on this black line, which is the, the muscle layer of the bowel. And you'll see it better when you see the abnormal one in a minute. So the bowel wall thickening, um, thickness can be varied a bit because the bowel will um, take a curve and there it will be bunched up a little bit. But in general, if you have to look too hard to see it, then it's probably not a nodule. Um, you sort of um, just follow it for as long as you can and sort of, um, and then contrasting it with the abnormal, you follow the bowel wall, you follow it and you keep on going and there it is, um, stuck to the posterior vagina. Um, so we were up to 37 seconds, um, so it doesn't take very long. You just pull the probe back and push it back in and you see it. Um, and so bowel nodules can be stuck to a uterosacral ligament nodule. They can be stuck to a vaginal nodule, so you see a bowel nodule and a vaginal nodule together, or the ovary can be stuck to it as well. So you get sort of a typical um, sort of picture of deep infiltrating endometriosis with a bowel nodule, a vaginal nodule, and an ovary stuck to it. So for instance, you put a probe um, behind the cervix. This looks like a very normal vaginal wall, but you need to go to the left and you need to go to the right. You can't just look in the midline because here is this big clump coming in with this bowel nodule stuck to it. And that's very, this was very, very painful, but this all is endometriosis. It's a very big clump on the pelvic, sort of on the vaginal side wall with bowel stuck to it. Again here, putting the probe in the posterior fornix, that was the same vaginal nodule as before, but see now here there's a, a bowel nodule stuck to it as well that I didn't point out before. Um, so this is the normal muscle layer of the bowel. This is the thick nodule on the, on the bowel. And they're often stuck together. So bowel nodules are often stuck in the pouch, so often you can get away with just putting the probe in the posterior fornix because you'll see them there right in front of you. 
The only time that doesn't work, the only time that putting the probe in the posterior fornix will not show you the bowel nodule, if, it's the, if the bowel nodule is on a free-lying loop of bowel, if um, um, endometriosis just randomly falls on a little bit of bowel and starts growing, and usually it starts growing and eventually it starts scarring quite a lot and it makes the, the bowel sort of curl up on itself almost and it can cause an obstruction. Um, so, so that's what they look like. So sort of, you can sort of see that they've sort of um, um, curled, um, sort of stretched the bowel, sort of make them almost do a 360. And I usually therefore measure them sort of um, how long I think they would be in a curved distance. So again, when you start at the anus and you sort of start um, following the bowel, and this little arrow is me telling the patient what I'm looking at, but um, basically pointing at um, that I, and it's not always easy because there can be bowel content like here, but still um, often when you sort of um, um, persist, you can sort of see enough of the bowel wall um, to recognize lesions. Um, and it's particularly the front wall of the bowel that you have to see. And can you see how big that is? I mean, um, and it's very easy to see on ultrasound. It's just an eyesore. So when you see a bowel lesion, I usually measure it in three dimensions, and I estimate the distance from the anus for the surgeons. I mean, it's only really important if it's very close to the anus. If it's less than seven centimeters, then usually it cannot be removed easily without a temporary colostomy, um, because it's too close to the anus. It's behind the rectal vaginal septum. Um, so if it's really close, it's important. I usually sort of start measuring. I measure, I push, I measure, I push, I measure, I push, so that I sort of get a, a, an idea, but usually, if it's stuck in the patch of Douglas, it's usually sort of about 12 or 13 centimeters from the anus. So it's only really if it's particularly close to the anus that um, it's important for the surgeon to know that. I try to see which layers are affected, but that's probably less important in, a, in, an, in an initial stage. Um, it's sort of, you can sort of see it go through the submucosa layer. Sometimes you can see white sort of uh, black strands going through um, the submucosa layer. And then I, um, I also um, a report whether it's stuck to something. Is it stuck to a vaginal nodule, to a uterosacral ligament nodule, or to the uterus or an ovary? Or is it in a free-lying loop of bowel? <coughs> Pietro Douglas obliteration, um, that is the second important um, um, sort of thing for surgeons to know. And that is just um, making sure that there is sliding between um, the back of the uterus here and the bowel. So it involves pushing. Um, you can only see it when you push. So here you can see it very clearly. Um, when you push on the uterus, it's sliding. And it should slide not just at the fundus, it should slide over the whole length of the uterus. It should slide over the back of the vagina. Um, and so that means there is completely no obliteration of the patch. Everything is nice and mobile. You can also do that with a retroverted uterus, um, although it's more difficult. I usually push and then I pull back on the vagina just so that I can see a bit of fluid um, Go in, um, go into that space behind the vagina. Um, so, obviously, the more fluid there is, the easier it is to see. Here, you can see that the vagina has nothing stuck to it, and the uterus has nothing stuck to it. But you can also see it with less fluid. It is harder with a posterior ut uh, a retroverted uterus. So, here, for instance, I push and I pull back, and see how there's a little bit of fluid just going into that space, and that makes you confident that there's nothing stuck there to the back of the vagina or nothing stuck to the uterus. Whilst here, again, that uterus is retroflexed, so that's an, a red flag for um, endometriosis, but if you push, nothing moves on the back of that, uh, of that uterus. Everything is completely stuck, and it's sliding here somewhere, so this patch is completely obliterated. You can look at the kidneys if you find severe endometriosis. I don't routinely look at the kidneys. I know that Lynn does, um, and that's better. Um, um, I, um, you can find silent hydronephrosis because endometriosis can grow on the pelvic side wall, and women may not know, but they have an obstructed ureter um, and, um, and, and, and um, um, hydronephrosis. Oops, sorry. And then you can um, check the appendix as well if you have a linear probe, also that I don't do. Um, but um, as I said, most surgeons are comfortable taking out an appendix and that's sort of not so much of a dilemma. 
Um, recently, and this is a free download, um, there, is, um, an, there was an article published in um, the WIDE journal. Um, you may be familiar with um, IOTA, who tried to sort of systematically describe all ovarian lesions. Um, they did the same with AITA for um, endometrial lesions. Um, they then brought out an article with a consensus and a systematic approach to myometrial lesions, which was called MUSA. And now there is one that is called ID um, for, um, for, um, uh, from the International Deep Endometriosis Analysis Group. And also, again, they want to sort of um, describe a systematic approach um, to um, the evaluation of the pelvis in women with endometriosis. And it basically goes through um, looking at the anterior compartment and the posterior compartment. So looking at the uterus, the ovaries, the bladder, the vagina, the patch of Douglas, the uterosacral ligaments, the bowel, and the kidneys. So I love this picture because I think um, it's not the size of what you're looking for, but knowing where to look. And I hope you know where to look now. So transvaginal ultrasound can ex uh, cannot exclude endometriosis, so we can never tell a patient that she does not have endometriosis, but it can diagnose deep infiltrating endometriosis with a high degree of accuracy, with a sensitivity and specificity well over 90%. Um, it, um, the the, the preoperative diagnosis benefits patients greatly, and everyone can look for endometriosis. Red flags should always be um, the antiverted fixed retroflex uterus with adenomyosis because there will be almost invariably deep infiltrating endometriosis, but also ovarian endometriomas are often associated with deep infiltrating endometriosis. And, um, and initially, definitely just keep the big picture in mind. You don't have to find every little bit. If you can just warn the surgeon about patch or Douglas obliteration and bowel nodules, that's the most important bit because that's what they need warning about. Um, so, um, as um, Jonathan was saying, um, we have a website. Um, it explains to patients what endometriosis is. It explains what the ultrasound can do. Um, it, um, if there are... Um, um, lectures or anything, um, then they're um, advertised on there. And there's also a link to our YouTube channel, um, which basically has presentations similar to this one um, um, on there, um, just um, for people who cannot get to a conference and who want to learn. Thank you.